I just want to say initially that as chair of the committee, I'm, I'm pleased that we are here discussing this issue, and I think as a society, generally, um, we are only really coming to terms with um, suicide and, and issues relating to suicide, and, and, and we often struggle about the types of interventions um, as a society that we need to advocate and, and, and promote and actually action. Uh, we're going to obviously look today at the whole area of suicide and, and suicidal behaviour. And, you know, it is, it is often hidden in our society, but as I say this, I'm mindful of the event that took place here yesterday, um, where the horrendous statistic of the 55 lives that were lost in Belfast alone last year. Um, family representatives came here to Parliament buildings and brought a heart symbol for each of their loved ones. And had a number of very clear, specific recommendations, which I don't think anybody in this room would, uh, would disagree with. And some of this is about moving this whole issue further up the agenda um, and looking at the, the, the types of interventions that we need. Because I think it is shameful when we're dealing with such an issue and the huge human cost and wider societal impact that suicide has that you know, we had the Protect Life strategy in, in June 2012, which had a two-year lifespan, and we're still waiting. You know, we're still waiting on a new updated suicide strategy, and I have to say that I am hugely disappointed that that is the case. Uh, and for the life of me, I don't understand what that blockage is, because we are a society of people that are coming out of conflict. We have all sorts of issues in relation to our mental well-being, and and yet we don't have you know a strategy or action plan in terms of implementation of that. So uh, when we reflect on the statistics as well, and we look at and I, I referenced the, the the stark statistics from Belfast just last year, but in 2014 there was 268 suicides across the north, and. You know, I don't think anybody would disagree that any one of those, any death like that, is just one too many. And I, I suppose from, from my own experience, and I've worked quite closely with Professor O'Neill at a local level, trying to drill down and understand the complexities of this issue. And I suppose one of them, and Siobhan, I'm assuming, will go into more detail around her own work that she's done. But I want to make reference to that because people look at this issue and they tend to almost mm. put it in a particular compartment and I know that there there is a whole huge debate taking place in the northwest around addiction issues and detoxification issues and all, all of this huge debate but the reality was whenever Siobhan's work um, was brought forward it was very apparent that the majority of those tragic cases the majority had mental health issues so as a society it wasn't this you know stereotypical view that we would have that people who took their own lives were somehow off their heads, addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, whatever it might be. But a huge percentage of them as well that were not known to services. And I think that's a real challenge as well uh, as we go forward. So what we have, I suppose, is we, we've really, we've little evidence, evidence in terms of trying to explain why some people may attempt or commit suicide. And it, it may be triggered by, you know, single events, a series of events. There, it may lead to thoughts of suicide or suicidal behaviour. And in, in some cases, increasingly, what we're finding is that suicidal behaviour is often linked to just feelings of hopelessness or worthlessness. You know, th those just very clear daily emotions um, and that there can be a link. Experts also believe that there's a number of factors, um, there are a number of factors that just may determine how a vulnerable person um, you know, views suicide or suicidal behaviour, and some of those factors, and they are listed, um, may include things like a person's life history. Um, there, there can be issues of trauma, there can be issues of um, history of, of sexual or, or physical abuse, and there can be issues there of, of serious mental health conditions and, and, and that was one of the points that I alluded to in terms of the evidence from the University of Ulster. Lifestyle, um, you know, if per a person susceptible to drug or alcohol misuse or are homeless and low levels of job satisfaction, um, being unemployed or being in debt. Relationship breakdown as well. 
has been an important finding coming out of some of those, this work. So I suppose reducing suicide means that reaching more people who may be at risk. So how do we do that? How do we do that as legislators? How do we do that in this room and beyond it? Uh, and we really do need, as a society, collectively, and I say all of us, need a better understanding of groups of people who are at risk, um, who are at risk of those thoughts or behaviours. And we do really need better collaboration between different sectors. And I, I make this point as well, that w when I've been dealing with the work locally in terms of the addiction task force and all of that, one of the very stark realities was there's a, there's a, there's a desperate a motive issue obviously for families and all of this but there's often a feeling of if there is a tragedy nobody ever helped nobody did anything for my son or my daughter that door was closed there's no services we don't have and when we started to drill down and look at some of those cases there was you know there was a couple of cases there we looked there was one case in particular we looked at and there was almost there's 30 plus interventions on the, on the young man's life there was huge intervention there were huge um, services there. Part of the difficulty, as I see it, was that there was no, I suppose, statutory requirement on those services, all doing massive amount of good work to produce a plan B. So effectively what was happening was when a family was in crisis, a young person was in crisis, a service that I can't do anymore, simply left. And, and there wasn't a sense of, we actually, whether well, it was the PSNI, the Education Board, the Public Health, the Trust, whoever it might have been, there was no requirement to do that statutory duty of cooperation to say, right, what is the next step? Um, because unfortunately that leads to tragedy, but it also leads to desperation or hopelessness and that sense of there is nothing out there, uh, when in fact there are a lot of good services and, and sometimes it's about how we utilise those as well. So I, I think there is a challenge, and, and I'm pleased just in the last number of weeks that I managed to get all-party agreement to set up a suicide prevention all-party group in the Assembly. Um, but my aim is clear on this. It's, it's to try to raise the issue further up the agenda, but it's equally to try to test concepts like zero suicide. We hear this bandied about. We hear about the examples in Merseyside and how they've succeeded in parts of the United States but if we're truthful, we, we, it's a tool, but we don't really understand it yet. So part of the remit of that group, as I see it, will be to test that, to, to, to try to tease out, well, what does that mean? You know, if it's a tool, how is it utilised? Um, you know, because there's some thinking that this is just done in around inpatient work. How do we take that forward? But I'm pleased that the group is set up. I'm pleased that all of the parties have signed up to that. And the first meeting of that, that group is this Monday. Um, and again, twofold, raise it up the, further up the political agenda and start to drill down on the zero suicide issue. So that's just a few um, initial remarks. Um, I'm sorry I can't stay, because trust me, I'd rather be in this room than chair in the committee. <laughs> um, but it, it's a critical issue, um, and I certainly hope that the learning from this can be utilised in this place and other places to try to really tackle the issue in terms of you know earlier intervention and prevention but certainly moving the whole issue further up the priority list the first presentation is from professor siobhan o'neill on behalf of the university of ulster and her presentation is about understanding suicide and suicidal behavior in the north secondly we have dr sharon mallon from the open university her presentation explores the dynamics of suicide among women another critically important point when we look at the change in uh, realities of, of suicide and gender. And finally, we have Dr. Denise O'Hagan and Gillian Armstrong, both from Queen's, um, who will focus on the relationship between anxiety, sleeping problems, and suicidal behaviours. So again, you're all very welcome. Um, I have no doubt that it will be an informative session. And certainly, as chair of the committee, my door is certainly open to the learning that comes from here and how we can actually action some of it. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to see that, that this is an issue that's been taken seriously and I'm really pleased to be here today to present some of my work and my sort of insights from that work on what we should be doing in Northern Ireland to try and drive the rates of suicide right down to zero.
Okay, I always start these sorts of talks with some general points about suicide. There's a lot of misconceptions about suicide out there. Um, so I want to go through these just to provide you with some of the kind of the theoretical stuff on suicide, what suicide is, and how we as psychologists understand suicidal behavior. So suicide is a behavioral outcome, and it's not an illness. Suicide is not an illness in and of itself. A lot of people with mental illnesses um, have suicidal thoughts and behave and, and self-harm and things like that, but it's not a mental illness in and of itself. There is, a, there is one mental illness that incorporates suicidal psychosis, but that's only, that only accounts for a very, very small number of suicides. So we're talking here about a behaviour that's some, it's something people do, and when we start to understand suicide as a behaviour, it changes the way we look at preventing that behaviour. So if you think of cancer as the illness and smoking as the behaviour that can lead to cancer, we tackle those two things in very, very different ways. So suicide as a behaviour and mental illness is certainly related to that behaviour, but the two aren't necessarily um, the same thing. So the behaviour results from a combination of social, psychological and indeed biological processes. And at the end of all of that, there is the capability, the ability to perform that final act that will result in death. So there's a lot of factors that come into play before the person ends up dead. And when we want to intervene, we, we can target all of those different levels. So mental illness is certainly really, really important. Previous behaviour is really important. The biggest predictor of any future behaviour is past behaviour. So if people talk about suicide or if they've committed acts of self-harm against themselves, then we need to take that very, very seriously. Moods are important, and our moods change from day to day. They change when we take alcohol and drugs. They change when we're recovering from the effects of alcohol and drugs. But moods are very important. Also, access to means. If we don't have the access to the method that will eventually result in our death, we won't be able to do anything about those thoughts. And some of the most effective suicide prevention interventions are actually around restricting access to means because we do know that some suicides are impulsive behaviours. So somebody has access to a gun or they're at a particular point in a bridge at a time when they're thinking about suicide. But if they were in a different time and place, that death might not have happened. So access to means is really, really important. And the ability to carry out that act, the ability to override those natural human defences of self-preservation, absolutely crucial in determining whether the person will die. Alcohol and substances um, are influential for all of these, and alcohol and substance strategies are linked certainly to suicide prevention strategies. However, and this is not said often enough, life events are also really relevant. We see that people who die by suicide in Northern Ireland, it's a combination of mental illness plus negative life events, and we've started to understand more about those life events. So every single social and economic policy that affects life events like bereavement, relationship breakup, all of those things will result in changes to our suicide rates. So we need to look at people who are going through adverse life events as well as all those other factors. So I've looked at all the theories of suicide many, many times, and I've put this together to try and help you understand what the theories, the academic theories of suicide tell us about the behaviour. We have all those background variables, the biological factors. We know some people respond impulsively to stress. That's a biological factor. Stress reactivity is set, it's programmed genetically and in early childhood. And those are the people who are more likely to lash out against themselves. So there is some people who have a biological predisposition. It doesn't mean they're certainly going to die by suicide, but it is a factor. Psychological factors, how we think, how our mood states are, life events, things that happen to us, and mental illness, whether we have depression, whether we have addictions, whether we have anxiety-related disorders, again, often lead to those impulsive behaviours that are associated with suicide. When we talk to people who are suicidal or who self-harm, we ask them, well, why did you do that? They very rarely will start to talk about their stress reactivity or their mental illness. They say, I was just in so much pain. The word pain comes up again and again and again. People talk about their unbearable psychological pain or indeed physical pain. And sometimes the two are all rolled together. We feel psychological pain as physical pain. And we know that acts of self-harm are used to anaesthetise pain because when we harm our body, we release natural endorphins. 
And people who do that again and again and again are more likely then to take that final act and, and end their lives by suicide when they're in pain. So the concept of pain is crucial here. When we look at the presentations to GPs prior to death, we can see how important that is, particularly for men. Pain can lead to thoughts, which can lead to actions. Pain can also lead to actions in the absence of a rational plan. And those are the suicides where somebody walks out after a breakup, jumps off a bridge, goes off and does something very spontaneous. Access to means can be really, really important in preventing those deaths. We know that when we remove access to one method of death, we don't get substitution. We don't get increases in other methods. So we know that a certain proportion of suicides are spontaneous, impulsive behaviours. And we can see that in the Northern Ireland data and also in our data when, when we interview people who are suicidal and they tell us, yes, I attempted suicide, but I, I, I didn't plan this. This wasn't a planned event. But when people are suicidal and we ask them why they didn't do anything about those thoughts, invariably they will tell us that their social connections, their links with their family and their social circle are what kept them from behaving in a manner that was like to, likely to lead to death. They thought about their families, they thought about their friends. And this is certainly another area in which we can intervene. Creating hope for the future is one thing, but reminding people of their connections and making sure that vulnerable groups in our society who have high rates of suicide and self-harm, that we do everything we can to make them feel part of our society, to make them feel connected that that can actually make a big difference to the suicide rates. So social connections are vitally important. And Durkheim was the first person to talk about how it was social factors and social, social mores, social rules that stop people from behaving in ways that would lead to their own deaths. So a wee word about mental illness and suicide. There was some talk about linking the, the mental health strategy and the suicide prevention strategies together. Um, most of the academics that I speak to, and indeed the World Health Organization, would say that this is an incredibly bad idea. Because most people with mental health problems do not attempt suicide. It's a tiny, tiny proportion. And there we can see that in the Venn diagram. It's about 5%. And as you can see in that wee red circle at the top, there are people who die by suicide. And we can't honestly say that they had a mental health problem. We don't know. We know most people probably do meet the criteria, but there's certainly a group in there. Um, and there's all sorts of assisted suicides, people that see their deaths as mercy killings. And who are we to judge if someone's pain from their depression is so great that they see no future? For them, it's as bad as having a terminal illness. And for them, it's not about a mental health issue. Um, so mental illness is something that we need to look at, we need to address. But the treatments for suicidal behaviour and mental illness are very, very different. And they, they take completely different approaches. So we should not let our suicide prevention work get lost within the, the general mental illness and the mental health work that we do. So the study, okay, the study I'm going to talk about today is a study that um, I led in, in the Ulster University where we looked at over 1,600 deaths by suicide. And we looked at the coroner's files. And those files would have contained witness statements, toxicology reports, medical reports, interviews with family members, and lots of details about the circumstances of death and the life events prior to death and even the use of services prior to death. So as you can see there, the last bullet point, there's three published papers. And if you want to know more about this, and if you want all the figures, because I'm not going to bombard you with a load of numbers today. If you want all the numbers, they're in those three papers, and they're all available from my website. I'm just going to round up some of the highlights, if you will, from this study of deaths of people who've, who've died. First thing that, that we're always interested in is what, what caused the suicide? What was it? And suicides are never, ever a simple thing. It's never just one event. And when you read a media report that, that, um, that suggests that a suicide was a result from one specific event, that's actually very, very dangerous. It simplifies things and it can influence vulnerable people. So when they have that life event, cyberbullying, relationship breakup, they think, well, people kill themselves after this. Actually, suicides are a hell of a lot more complex than that. In 39% of cases, there was no known adverse events. That doesn't mean there weren't any. It just means that they weren't recorded. And we know sometimes that families don't report things that happen to people because they're so stigmatizing. And often the people who die by suicide have done things that they're terribly ashamed of. 
We have a lot of sex offenders in there, a lot of people who have committed various crimes. So the behaviour or the events that, that surround suicide deaths can sometimes be so stigmatised that we daren't even mention them. Relationship problems was a broad category that included in younger people friendships and in older people it was relationship breakups and sometimes it was very difficult to establish even whether the person was married or single or getting divorced or whether there was talk of a breakup. Um, but 40%, 40.3% had relationship problems. Death and grief, 12%, death of everything from a spouse to a son or daughter or a pet loss is a, is a feature of both of those categories. Health fears, in the older age groups, um, we had a lot of reports of people who thought they had cancer or somebody they loved had some terminal illness. They were scared about their own health. And, and we can ask the question then, was that suicide? Was this something to do with the debates about assisted suicide that we have at the minute? Really, really interesting there. Financial concerns and employment crisis, we bunched those together um, and 12.9% there. We know there's been an excess of 500 deaths in the Republic of Ireland since the austerity measures were brought in. I did the cal calculations for my TED talk and it'll be 200 here if we don't do something about the austerity measures. That's the equivalent number of people who die extra as a result from austerity. So every time we cut jobs, we remove um, f money from the, the most vulnerable people, we're increasing the rates of suicide there. Substance use, about 1 in 10 were known to have substance use disorders. Um, it may well be a lot higher than that because these things aren't always reported. And most of those cases were alcohol abuse rather than drug abuse. But certainly there were known drug abusers. Now alcohol itself was present in over half of the deaths. Um, so what we found was that a lot of these people wouldn't have been known alcoholics, that they had taken alcohol as part of their, their suicide attempt, almost to give them courage to override their natural impulses to stay alive. So alcohol is a big factor, but a lot of people use alcohol in our society. It is something we need to look at. More males and more younger, younger people would be in those categories. And those are the references there for two of the papers. So those are the life events and if we're trying to prevent suicide we need to try and help people who've had those terrible things happen to them as well as people with mental health problems. Now 31% of those who died didn't have any known mental health problems. So there's a group of people who were never known to have depression, anxiety, and yet we know that up to 95% of people who die by suicide have mental health problems. So there's a really obvious thing there we can do in terms of reducing the stigma around mental health problems and getting people to come forward and ask for help. Disordered substance use, again, I've put that in under mental health problems. We have this interest in gender difference, and Sharon will probably talk about it in a wee bit more detail, but men withdraw from services prior to death. We can see they may have been in contact with their doctor or the mental health services maybe a year or two before the death, but they withdraw. The connections just aren't there. They, and you can see that fits with the model of hopelessness, where they don't think the services are helping them, there's nothing they can do, and they pull away. They withdraw. Women escalate their use of services. They give us lots more to work with. Women will go and report their suicidal ideation. Women are much more likely to self-harm, to attempt suicide. So these are two very, very different patterns, and we need to look at men and women slightly differently. Men are more likely to report only physical health problems prior to death. So when they do go to their GP, and they mostly will go to their GP, they report things like headaches, back pain non-specific pain. Links back to our idea of pain, and pain is one of the symptoms of depression. Pain can also be felt very, very much if you have a, a relationship breakup or you're feeling lost. Pain is something that you will have. And men, we think men are more likely to experience their depression as a physical somatic pain. So one of the things we're doing now is telling GPs to be just to be wary about men who've had a few different life events and who report non-specific pain, headaches, backaches, those sorts of things, because that can be indicative of a mental health problem. And we might not recognise it, and they certainly won't recognise it, because when somebody's suicidal, they don't think, I have a mental health problem, I need counselling. They think, I'm just in so much pain, I need to end this. And that, that's the way the thought process is. There's lots of services out there, as may have said, but it's getting people to recognise that that pain that they have can be addressed in some way and that there is hope and that those services are for them, which they're not doing at the minute. 
Okay, our autopsy studies where we look into the case histories and the likes of uh, Tom Foster did a lot of work in this area in Northern Ireland. We do see that most of them would have mental health problems. And we know that most mental health problems are treatable. It can be difficult, but they are treatable. So these things can be addressed and prevented, but it's a get about getting people to the services. I did a bit of work in Northern Ireland where we looked at exposure to trauma and suicidal behaviour. And I think it's really relevant um, that we're in a post-conflict society and that that has been linked to the increase in suicide rates. So we know we have high rates of mental health disorders here. And we also have the legacy of the conflict, which has had a particular effect on our society. We have pockets of areas who've been, where people have been exposed to the troubles and they've also high levels of poverty and economic deprivation. Hate crime, intolerance, racism, all of those sorts of things. And it's those areas that have the high rates of suicide. Once you take out deprivation and poverty, the rates are similar across Northern Ireland. But the, the high rates, the clusters, map right onto those areas of poverty and deprivation. And those rates also have high, um, high usage of alcohol and substances and high levels of exposure to trauma. Interestingly, there's been a study a number of years ago that showed that a quarter of gay and lesbian people in Northern Ireland have attempted suicide. So there's one group that we need to look at very clearly. And I would argue that marriage equality is part of making LGBT people in Northern Ireland feel that they're connected to society and valued and treasured as part of our society. Um, Tomlinson argued that conflict increased connectedness. And we see that around the world, where there's a war, where there's a civil conflict. It almost brings people together. People are fighting for a common cause. So there's a lot of those social connections. But in those post-conflict post societies, in areas where there's poverty, where we haven't seen the dividends of the peace process, we have the high rates of suicide. And we now seem to have groups of people in Northern Ireland who are disenfranchised with the peace process who are reconstructing what has happened and have different ideas about what the fight was for, what all that struggle was for and what they've seen and done, the trauma they've been exposed to, what that has achieved. And that can be very, very unsettling. Um, we're looking at a veterans' mental health at the minute and we have this concept of moral injury when you do something that goes against your own moral code. At the time, it seemed like the right thing to do, looking back. It, it, it can have terrible consequences for your mental health if, if you can't understand what that has achieved. So reduce connectedness, especially those who've been most affected by the troubles in Northern Ireland. And we also have this mass exposure to pain and trauma and violence. And Thomas Joyner would argue that all of that exposure to pain anaesthetises us, it habituates us. It makes it more likely that we'll respond to our own pain with acts of physical violence against ourselves. And in the Northern Ireland study of health and stress, which I was involved with, um, we looked at 4,000 people and we found that people who've been exposed to the troubles have higher rates. Um, even when we take mental illness out of it, when we control for mental illness, they have higher rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviour. So trauma, exposure and pain is related to suicidal behaviour in Northern Ireland. Okay, we have another few minutes. We're doing okay. So individual treatments. And this is what I said earlier. If you're treating somebody for a mental illness, then recognised treatments are talking treatments and or medications. So typically there'll be appointments, the person will come and go, they'll get therapy and over time it will either work and they'll be put on to something different. If you've got somebody who's suicidal, it's, it's completely, what you need to do is, is completely different. First thing is you need to ask about risk of suicide. You need to ask, are you suicidal? You'll not put ideas in someone's head. We all know suicide's out there. It's an option for us, whether we like it or not. Whether we want it to be or not, it is there. It exists. But we should ask about risk, but we should be wary of risk assessment because most of those deaths and service users are people who've been discharged, who've been perceived to be at low risk. So our little simple triage that we do for um, other mental health conditions doesn't work for suicide risk. We need suicide-specific counselling, and that is about creating hope for the future creating connectedness, and then working out how to treat underlying mental health disorders. But if we don't have that connectedness and hope, the person may well feel that a treatment's not possible. We need wraparound warm handover. We can't send somebody who's suicidal home and tell them to come back in a fortnight's time, because that only increases their sense of hopelessness and helplessness. 
So the current model that Lifeline were providing where they, they didn't refer people, you didn't have to make your own phone call. Once you phoned Lifeline, that was it. That worked really, really well for people who are suicidal because it takes so much courage to come forward and say, I have a problem here. So warm handover is essential. We look at options, we promote hope, we promote connectedness. Family therapy should be part of suicide prevention. And that's slightly different from other mental health um, conditions, from depression, anxiety disorders, we'd offer one-to-one -one counselling. And suicide prevention, we need to get everybody in the family in there. And then for people who are self-harming, we need to talk about how we replace that behaviour, rather than just telling them, you can't do this, because what you're doing there is backing them into a corner. And then finally, at the end, we do need to treat the mental health disorders. But you can see why treatment for suicide is a completely different ballgame. And we shouldn't just assume that getting people into mental health services is going to be enough. OK, I have three slides that I'm going to end with. And you can read these. And I'm just going to rattle through them really quickly. But these are my ideas for policy implications. First one is average age of people, 40 years, mostly men. We've got to target all the age groups. This idea that it's only young men or it's only an issue that affects young men, that's no longer the case. We should not neglect women, and it's great that Sharon's going to be talking about women because they have a very different profile. And to date, we have been neglecting women. If we want to really work out who's more likely to die by suicide, particularly in women, we're going to have to link that self-harm database with the suicide database and try and work out what the risk strategies there are. We need to restrict access to means wherever we can um, and that's bridges, internet ad advice on how to kill yourself, and it's out there. All of those sorts of things influence behaviour. And media reporting is really crucial. There's safe reporting guidelines. If we glamorise suicide, we don't know we're doing it sometimes. We think we're commemorating somebody, but we're actually glamorising it. And when somebody's vulnerable, they'll see that and think, maybe that's the answer. We need to look at how we identify and pe treat people with mental illness, obviously. We need a stigma uh, reduction campaign in Northern Ireland. And we need to recognise that life events and people feeling their lives are terrible, that, that, that that's a mental health thing and that we need to um, get men who have those negative life events, we need to get them forward under services. So help seeking for life events and stress. Primary care is where most people go, that's where people end up prior to their death. It's not mental health services. So we need to take a good hard look at what, how our primary care services are doing there. Because I don't know about you guys, but you know when people are suicidal, it's three in the morning, and my doctor's surgery is not open then. So we need to make sure that the services are there for people when they need them. The third slide, yeah, alcohol and substance, certainly we need to look at that. It's a, it's a big factor, but it's not, it's not the only thing that's relevant. Look at how we uh, deal with people who have relationship breakups. The first place I went when my marriage went to pot was the solicitor's office. And my solicitor certainly was in no position to talk about suicide risk or mental health. So I suspect there's a lot more we could be doing for people who have financial problems, employment difficulties, death and loss, and troubles related trauma. They've actually taken out that question about suicide risk when people go to get victim services now, which is complete madness. It goes against all the advice. We should be asking everybody. And then we should know what to do when somebody reports they're suicidal. So every single social policy is, is important here. So this is not just about the health committee. This is about, this is about everybody. It's about everybody here doing our bit to help create hope, to help prevent suicide, and to drive those rates down to zero. And finally, and I would say this, but I think we need to maintain that database that we got all this information from, and we need to continue to record information, because that's the only way we'll understand changing patterns and what's happening here in Northern Ireland. And that's me. Thank you.